I'm sure by now you've all heard the phrase, they don't make them like they used to. Well, never has that phrase applied less to a new vehicle than it does with the Toyota 4Runner. For 2023 model year, the 4Runner is going to continue with the same design that Toyota launched back in 2009 as a 2009 model year 4Runner. In some states, 14 years old is enough to get a provisional driver's license. So let's take a look at the 4Runner and see why it is such an odd duck. Because this is ancient, but it sells incredibly well. In fact, so well that I almost wonder why Toyota is bothering to redesign it at all. Rumor mill says that 2024 is going to bring us an all new 4Runner. We don't know any details about about that, but we do know that the 4Runner had its best sales year ever in 2021. Yes, that's right. It did not sell better in 2009, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20 than it did last year in 2021. Absolutely bonkers. That actually put the 4Runner on the top 25 best-selling vehicles in America list first time ever. The 4Runner is not entirely a window into Toyota's past because they have tweaked the design over time. This now has features like Toyota's latest active safety systems. We have full LED headlights up front, fog lights down below right there, and a grille design that's definitely a bit more harmonious with some of Toyota's larger, more rugged vehicles. We don't know exactly what the new Tacoma is going to look like, but most indications point to it having a grille shape that's pretty similar to what we see on this 4Runner and the current Tacoma. It's worth noting this hood scoop up top, it's not functional. Moving around to the side, we find the sort of bug-eyed headlights that we found in Toyotas of the past, but blended with a very boxy and distinctive shape. And I think this is the big reason the 4Runner sells well, is because it honestly looks really good. I like the squareness of the design. I love the tall roof line. That's something that we don't find in many SUVs anymore. And we have a very vertical back end, making this insanely cargo practical. This has a huge cargo area in the back. And if you want to get your 4Runner as a three row vehicle, you can get a teeny tiny third row in the back. Rather unfortunately, this model does not have the baby third row. This is just a two row SUV. Toyota has also been doing a really good job lately playing up their off-road division TRD. This is the TRD Sport trim. It's just one level up from the bottom. So this is not a TRD Pro, but it gives you some of the off-road capabilities that you'd find in the more extreme versions of the 4Runner. And those more extreme versions of the 4Runner are also part of why the 4Runner is selling so well. The structure of the vehicle was designed for that from the beginning. This has a traditional ladder frame underneath. It's a body on frame vehicle. Reasonable ground clearance in most models, although you will find more in some modern crossovers with adaptive air suspensions or modern SUVs with adaptive air suspensions as well. I'm intrigued to see what happens with the new 4Runner, because I think what happened with this one is that its design hung out long enough that it turned into modern retro. And that's really obvious with these tail lamp modules in the back. So I kind of wonder, is Toyota going to stick with that modern retro theme, or are they going to give us a thoroughly modern 4Runner when it gets completely redesigned in about 18 months to two years? Out back, the retro theme is definitely apparent with these tail lamp modules. These harken back to a different era with the silver accents inside the turn signal module. These are partial LED elements, so the brake lights and the backup lights or I should say the backup lights and the turn signals are incandescent, the other lights are LEDs. We also have a feature we just don't find on modern SUVs anymore. We have a power rear window. This is something we don't even find on the Toyota Sequoia. Now, fortunately, Toyota has kept this on the new Tundra with the bigger cab, so I hope that this feature makes it to the new model because that is a really cool practical feature. It really helps you put larger items into the vehicle. They can hang out the back more easily with the lid closed, or of course, you can just help ventilate the vehicle. And then if you wanna open the hatch, we do have a traditional lift up hatch, not powered in this particular model. The 4Runner is related to the Land Cruiser Prado, which in the United States is the Lexus GX, and that has a swing to the side door, which really would be retro, but I think this is a bit more practical for Americans. Diving under the 4Runner, the truck heritage is immediately obvious. We have a spare tire exactly where you'd expect to find it in a pickup truck, and a two inch receiver because this is rated to tow 5,000 pound standard. If the 4Runner had a mantra, it would be tried and true. Under the hood, we find the same 4-liter V6 engine that we found under this hood for more than a decade. This produces 270 horsepower and 278 pound-feet of torque. The old-school design even includes the cooling design of the vehicle. It still has an engine belt-driven fan up front rather than an electric fan like we find in most modern SUVs. Some folks really, really love that particular aspect of this engine. The downside to this is the fuel economy. 18 miles per gallon is what you can expect in all versions of the 4Runner, rear-wheel drive or four-wheel drive. 
that's likely due as much to the age of the engine as to the age of the transmission. This has a five speed automatic transmission, not a six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 speed automatic like we find in many modern SUVs. In fact, all of Toyota's newest vehicles use a 10 speed transmission, so the new Sequoia and the new Tundra literally have twice the number of gears as this 4Runner, and that's part of why they get better fuel economy. If you'd like your four-runner rear-wheel drive, you can do that, or you can choose between two basic different four-wheel drive systems. The limited trim, which is sort of the mid-level luxury trim of four-runner, is the only model with a Torsen center differential. It has a true center differential. It'll split power front and rear wherever it's needed. Then there are a variety of different part-time four-wheel drive systems. They're based around the same two-speed transfer case, but they add or remove a locking differential and some extra software in the vehicle. The ultimate expression of 4Runner off-road capability is going to be in the top-end TRD Pro model. That's going to give you a locker in the rear, crawl control, their traction management system that's going to sort of simulate a locker up front. It does not have a true locking differential in the front, even in that top-end model, however. Jumping inside, we find one of Toyota's older front seat designs. It still has a decent range of motion, however, but we just have a two-way adjustable lumbar support, and the front passenger seat in this trim is not powered at all. We have a tilt telescopic steering column, but it has a pretty small range of motion, especially in the tilt direction, so taller and shorter drivers might have troubles finding a good driving position. The seat does move, however, up and down, and even though this is somewhat related to the Tacoma, the seating position is much more normal in here. In the Tacoma, it really feels like you're sitting practically on the floor with your arms and legs stretched out in front of you. In this, it has a slightly taller cab, so it's a little bit easier to find a more ideal, more upright, traditional SUV driving position. Jumping into the back seat, we definitely find less legroom back here than we find in the modern Grand Cherokee or even the four-door Wrangler, although it's not as little as you might think. On the chart on the side of your screen, it looks like this is below 75 inches, but either there's something wrong with the measurement or it just has to do with the way that I prefer sitting in the front seat, but it feels a bit roomier than that number would otherwise indicate. Also keep in mind that if you get the optional third row in the back, that's going to change the seat positioning around, so that could have something to do with it. This is not as wide as a modern Grand Cherokee or something like a Hyundai Santa Fe inside. So the rear bench is not going to be as wide as those options, but we actually have a fairly small hump in the middle because this is a body on frame vehicle. So all the drivetrain stuff is down there in the frame and there's very little interruption in the body as a result. Scooting all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. And as you can see, I have about two inches of legroom left. The rear seats fold in a very traditional SUV fashion. First, we pop up the seat bottom cushion. We then start tilting the seat forward or recline the headrest, whichever way you want to do that. Then you have to lower the headrest if it's been raised up. Then it ducks down right there into that carve out in the rear seat bottom cushion. We then have a load floor in the back that is almost completely flat with the rear and this seat back. It just does a little bit of a ramp up. Behind the manual hatch, we find the largest cargo area in the midsize SUV or crossover segment. Over 47 cubic feet of storage space back here, putting this massively ahead of the Jeep Grand Cherokee, the Hyundai Santa Fe, etc. This is a really long cargo area. It's really wide and it is very, very square. So if you're really planning on packing up your vehicle to go camping, road tripping, etc., the 4Runner is simply going to swallow more stuff than anything else in the two row segment. And even if you get the teeny tiny third row, there's a reasonable amount of storage space behind. Not a lot, but just a little. Going in for a closer look, there's some small storage cubbies on either side, a 400 watt AC inverter and a 12 volt power outlet back here. One area where the 4Runner really shows its age is this incredible distance between the actual cargo area and the back end of the vehicle. So you are going to have to lift your cargo in pretty far in order to get it into the cargo area, which is why you can get an optional cargo slide that basically does this sort of thing out of the cargo area on rollers. Now, I wouldn't get that if I were you because it is gonna reduce your actual storage capacity. The interior has a decidedly retro feel with the way that these map lights work, these big chunky buttons for the garage door opener presets, that toggle for the map lights and the buttons that we find up here in the ceiling. This is the least expensive member of the TRD family, but they wanted to make it feel special, so we get an embroidered logo on the front headrests only, height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, and imitation leather, basically vinyl seats here. On the upper section of the door panels, there are a reasonable amount of soft touch materials. We then find harder plastics down there at the bottom of the door. We have a very vertical theme here and lots of storage spaces. So a little storage cubby right there just below that handle. And then down there at the bottom, we get sort of a dual divider for the bottle holder and then an extended storage cubby all the way back there towards the rear. Moving over to the dashboard, we find a very historic theme for Toyota with the bold 
horizontal elements in the dashboard. There's a slot style glove compartment. It is pretty large. I was able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside, absolutely no problem. And then you'll find the buttons and switches for things in a sort of horizontal location right there, pointing up at the ceiling. And that also applies if I scoot all the way over here to the driver's side, to the driver's side button bank where we have lots of buttons. This button bank really gives me a Land Rover, Range Rover vibe. Moving back to the center of the dashboard, we have a decidedly retro digital clock in the middle of the dash two large air vents, and then a slightly more modern touchscreen infotainment system. This system does support Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, so if you'd rather use that interface, you can do that, but there's also a stock interface with the system. This is not Toyota's latest software. We probably won't see that in the Forerunner until it gets completely redesigned. There's a physical volume knob over here, two knob over there, engine start, stop button on that side, and this model does not have automatic climate controls, just knobs right there for the climate control functions. Below that, we have some small storage cubbies, but clearly this car was designed before the era of big smartphones because there's really nowhere good to put a big smartphone like that. It won't even fit in that cubby and it really doesn't fit in that cubby either. Down here, we have the control for the four-wheel drive system. Two high, four high, four low. This is a part-time four-wheel drive system. Two big cup holders, but strangely split and oddly shallow. This one is pretty shallow right there. This one back here is a little bit deeper and it has a removable rubber liner to make it a little bit more useful. Then there's a small storage area right there where I guess you could try and keep your smartphone. And there's sort of a pencil holder there and one of Toyota's classic gated shifters below. In case you're wondering, you can power that rear window from the inside. That's where that switch would be. And then there are two button blanks for other features next to it. Between the front seats, we find a padded center console, then a pretty big storage cubby underneath it. The entire center console is actually quite low for a rear wheel drive vehicle. That's because we're sitting really high up off the ground, so the transmission has a lot of room between the frame elements and some portions of the body to accommodate that. So the transmission does not really impede on this area, and the result is a very low center console, giving this a bit more of an airy feel than we find in some modern trucks or SUVs. On the driver's side, we have a four dial instrument cluster with a pretty small multifunction display in the middle. This has been grafted on because apparently it's required for Toyota's latest active safety systems, which are all adjusted via this screen. The steering wheel is one of Toyota's older designs. On the right-hand side, we find a joystick-style button bank for controlling that small multifunction LCD. Controls for the radar adaptive cruise control system are here for the distance, and then down there on that little stock for the actual speed selection, the stock moves with the steering wheel. We then have the lane centering button, and then on this side of the steering wheel, we have some phone buttons, voice command, and then some infotainment controls above. Over the years, the Forerunner has adapted a few extra features, which is part of why Toyota has used some button blanks like this in the past. We have a 360 degree camera system, heated windshield wiper de-icer, and then the onboard AC inverter, 400 watts max there. Pressing the camera icon gets you one of the tiniest and grainiest 360 degree cameras I have ever seen. I honestly don't know quite what this is useful for because you could lose boulders or even small children inside the graininess of that image. It is kind of cool that it has it and that they've adapted it, but it really does have an old school vibe. And in keeping with the old school vibe, when you're in reverse, we have this little display here, which again, not overly useful, and we don't have any sort of dynamic lines there. Those are just lines telling you the maximum and minimum extent of the turning radius in the rear. You can maximize it a little bit. It's a tiny bit less grainy, but honestly, it's not too much more useful than that look. Out on the road, the retro vibe continues. There's definitely a decent amount of spacing between the gears in this five-speed automatic transmission. So just as the engine's really getting into the meat of its power band, it's time to shift and all of it is over. And that's why zero to 60 definitely takes a while. Zero to 60 in this model happened in 7.9 seconds. That's just a hair faster than the last model that I tested, which was the TRD Pro. That was about six or seven years ago. That model went zero to 60 in eight seconds. This also took a little bit less time to stop, a little bit less distance to stop, I should say. 125 feet in this model. The TRD version with the all-terrain tires, it's definitely gonna take a bit longer to stop. Rewinding the clock to back when the Forerunner was designed, and I'm not talking about 2009 when this was released, I'm talking about the years before that when it was designed, Body-on-frame SUVs with solid axles in the back were pretty common. General Motors had a ton of them. We also had occasional SUVs from Ford and from Jeep with solid axles in the same configuration. So this absolutely was not unusual. And in that world, the Forerunner's design mission was to be more of a middle-of-the-road kind of vehicle with good on-road driving dynamics and good off-road driving dynamics, which is why we also have the limited trim of this vehicle with the Torsen Center differential. That's going to give you the kind of sure-footed feel that you want if you're routinely driving in the snow, on ice, slippery conditions, etc. Honestly, for my lifestyle, 
the Torsen center differential would probably be the best fit because I want something that's perhaps a little bit nicer on the inside, a little bit more street focused maybe than off-road focused, but I still want that all-time traction. If you live in Colorado or the Midwest, etc., and you're worried about snow traction, that's the model of 4Runner that I would recommend. The reason for that is that part-time four-wheel drive systems, like the one that's on this particular 4Runner, they're not really meant for use on regular paved roads with good traction. You can actually end up damaging system components, and you can also end up reducing the handling ability of the vehicle. That's because this system does not allow slip between the front axle and the rear axle. The inputs are spinning at the same speed. That can cause binding and it can cause damage to the components. When it comes to the handling score, I'm going to give the 4Runner a C+. Remember that in this same price range, we have a ton of sharp handling crossovers that would include anything from a Subaru Outback in Santa Fe to a Ford Edge, Jeep Grand Cherokee, etc. And all of them are going to have a more dynamic feel out on the road than the 4Runner. It's a little difficult to tell exactly what the front tires are doing. And thanks to the tire size, the, the tire aspect ratio that we have on this vehicle and the steering and front suspension design, you can wobble the steering wheel a reasonable amount without having the vehicle wobble around itself. So everything has a more disconnected feel than the rest of the competition. It also has a feel that is honestly a little bit more truck-like at times, logically because of the design of the vehicle. Now on the upside, there's a reasonable amount of isolation between the body and the frame. So depending on the road surface, some road surfaces can feel smoother in here than some of the average crossovers, but some of them can also be a little bit harsher. Depending on the surface that you're driving on, there can also be a bit of a handling penalty for having that solid axle in the rear versus an independent suspension. Ride quality is pretty decent in the 4Runner thanks to the pretty tall tires that we have on this model. Again, another hallmark of a classic SUV, one with a slightly more rugged mission in mind than something like a RAV4. But the suspension can get upset on broken pavement or on washboard pavement or on gravel roads like this, especially if you go a little bit faster through the potholes, you'll definitely feel the rear suspension wobbling around a little bit, just as you'd expect out of a live axle. But this is one of the better behaved solid axle suspension systems available in America. This does not really feel like a pickup truck most of the time. This reminds me an awful lot of the Saab 97 Aero and the GMC Envoy that I used to have once upon a time, and perhaps the world where the Jeep Grand Cherokee used to have a solid axle in the rear as well. There's a lot of debate out there as to whether a live axle or an independent suspension is really better for off-roading duty. One thing is absolutely clear, lifting a live axle is an awful lot easier. So you want to add a lift kit to the vehicle, it's going to be a lot easier with this kind of suspension setup. And that's part of the reason that we find it in a Wrangler. Also, if you want to do really extreme kind of rock crawling stuff, you're going to want a solid axle. However, for a lot of mild off-roading, soft off-roading, an independent suspension can be a better balance. And that's why we find fully independent suspensions in vehicles from Land Rover and Jeep, of course, because they're just a better balance of on-road and off-road driving dynamics. Back out on the paved road, I measured 71 decibels at 50 miles an hour, making this relatively quiet for this segment. There is a bit of isolation between the frame and the body, just as you'd find in a half-ton pickup truck. And that does mean that if you plan on towing with your SUV, this is going to be quieter inside than really any of the competition that you might be cross-shopping it against, because all of those are probably going to be unibody vehicles. And in a unibody vehicle, generally speaking, as the receiver and the hitch ball are rattling around together, the vehicle can act kind of like a drum, and it will actually be louder inside than outside when that hitch is rattling around there. But in a body-on-frame vehicle like this, where there's some isolation between the body and the frame, things are a lot quieter. That's also what you see in mid-sized trucks and full-size trucks. When it comes to fuel economy, perhaps the less said about this, the better. I've been averaging 14.6 miles per gallon, so obviously this is going to get a D when it comes to the fuel economy score. You will get better fuel economy in pretty much everything else out there, including considerably more powerful vehicles with V8 engines. I blame the transmission. This just does not have very many gears to choose from, and out on the open highway, the engine ends up revving pretty high, higher than it probably really needs to, to go that speed, and that really ends up dropping your highway fuel economy. Also, thanks to the distance between the gears, climbing hills, especially hill climbing with a trailer connected, can be, let's just say, a little bit more traditional than most of the competition. Bottom line, the 4Runner is a very specific kind of vehicle. This was designed for towing, for off-roading, for lots of cargo in the back, but it was also designed in an era where more SUVs were designed for these sorts of things. Then generally car design moved away from that, moved towards crossovers like the Edge instead of the original Ford Explorers, like a fully independent suspension to Grand Cherokee instead of one with two solid axles, etc. But meanwhile, 
Also interestingly, sales of the Wrangler have gone up and other manufacturers like Subaru and now even Mazda, they've decided that they need to have more rugged versions of their crossovers. Well, Toyota has an answer for people that want something more rugged. They have the original more rugged thing right here with the 4Runner. So really this stands alone. If you're interested in this kind of reliability, this particular style of driving, it does have a solid feel while towing. It is a little sluggish, but it has a solid feel. And you're looking for the off-road ability that you'll find really in every version that has four-wheel drive of the 4Runner, then look no further than this vehicle. Appropriate competition would be something like a Wrangler on the more rugged end of things, or a Grand Cherokee on the more luxurious end of things. But aside from that and a Ford Bronco, there really isn't a lot in America that is like the 4Runner, especially not for this price. Now, if you want to know about detailed pricing and comparisons, check out the buyer's guide video. That's essentially part two of this video. There's going to be a link down there in the description that's going to be coming about a day after this video. You'll also find a link at the end of the video. Just watch all the way to the end. Click the button on the lower right hand side of the screen, and that will take you on over to that video. Buyer's guide videos will be updated regularly more regularly than review videos like this. That's part of why I'm separating them. Also, that buyer's guide video is gonna focus on 2023 pricing because we already know that for the 4Runner and we know that it is essentially the same 4Runner for yet another year. I'll see all of you later.